an autobiography by Charlotte Bronte. Chapter 4 From my discourse with Mr. Lloyd, and from the above reported conference between Bessie and Abbott, I gathered enough of hope to suffice as a motive for wishing to get well. A change seemed near. I decided and waited it in silence. It tarried, however. Days and weeks passed. I had regained my normal state of health, but no new allusion was made to the subject over which I brooded. Mrs. Reed surveyed me at times with a severe eye, but seldom addressed me. Since my illness, she had drawn a more marked line of separation than ever between me and her own children, appointing me a small closet to sleep in by myself, condemning me to take my meals alone and pass all my time in the nursery, while my cousins were constantly in the drawing room. Not a hint, however, did she drop about sending me to school. Still, I felt an instinctive certainty that she would not long endure me under the same roof of her, for her glance, now more than ever, when turned on me, expressed an insuperable and rooted aversion. Eliza and Georgiana, evidently acting according to orders, spoke to me as little as possible. John thrust his tongue in his cheek whenever he saw me, and once attempted chastisement. But as I instantly turned against him, roused by the same sentiment of deep ire and desperate revolt which had stirred my corruption before, he thought it better to desist, and ran from me uttering execrations and vowing I had burst his nose. I had indeed levelled at that prominent feature as hard a blow as my knuckles could inflict, and when I saw that either that or my look daunted him, I had the greatest inclination to follow up my advantage to purpose, but he was already with his mamma. I heard him in a blubbering tone commence the tale of how that nasty Jane Eyre had flown at him like a mad cat. He was stopped rather harshly. Don't talk to me about her, John. I told you not to go near her. She is not worthy of notice. I do not choose that either you or your sisters should associate with her. Here, leaning over the banister, I cried out suddenly, and without at all deliberating on my words. They are not fit to associate with me. Mrs. Reed was rather a stout woman, but on hearing this strange and audacious declaration, she ran nimbly up the stair, swept me like a whirlwind into the nursery, and crushing me down on the edge of my crib, dared me in an emphatic voice to rise from that place or utter one syllable during the remainder of the day. What would Uncle Reed say to you if he were alive? was my scarcely voluntary demand. I say scarcely voluntary, for it seemed as if my tongue pronounced words without my will consenting to their utterance. Something spoke out of me over which I had no control. What? said Mrs. Reed under her breath. Her usually cold, composed grey eye became troubled with a look like fear. She took her hand from my arm and gazed at me as if she really did not know whether I were child or fiend. I was now in for it. My Uncle Reed is in heaven and can see all you do and think, and so can Papa and Mamma. They know how you shut me up all day long and how you wish me dead. Mrs. Reed soon rallied her spirits. She shook me most soundly. She boxed both my ears and then left me without a word. Bessie supplied the hiatus by a homily of an hour's length, in which she proved beyond a doubt that I was the most wicked and abandoned child ever reared under a roof. I half believed her, for I felt indeed only bad feelings surging in my breast. November, December, and half of January passed away. Christmas and the New Year had been celebrated at Gateshead with the usual festive cheer. Presents had been interchanged. Dinners and evening parties given. From every enjoyment I was, of course, excluded. My share of the gaiety consisted in witnessing the daily apparelling of Eliza and Georgiana and seeing them descend to the drawing room, dressed out in thin muslin frocks and scarlet sashes with hair elaborately ringletted, and afterwards in listening to the sound of the piano or the harp played below, to the passing to and fro of the butler and footman to the jingling of glass and china as refreshments were handed, 
to the broken hum of conversation as the drawing room door opened and closed. When tired of this occupation, I would retire from the stairhead to the solitary and silent nursery. There, though somewhat sad, I was not miserable. To speak truth, I had not the least wish to go into company, for in company I was very rarely noticed, and if Bessie had but been kind and companionable, I should have deemed it a treat to spend evenings quietly with her, instead of passing them under the formidable eye of Mrs. Reed in a room full of ladies and gentlemen. But Bessie, as soon as she had dressed her young ladies, used to take herself off to the lively regions of the kitchen and housekeeper's room, generally bearing the candle along with her. I then sat with my doll on my knee till the fire got low, glancing round occasionally to make sure that nothing worse than myself haunted the shadowy room, and when the embers sank to a dull red, I undressed hastily, tugging at knots and strings as I best might, and sought shelter from cold and darkness in my crib. To this crib I always took my doll. Human beings must love something, and in the death of worthy objects of affection, I contrived to find a pleasure in loving and cherishing a faded, graven image, shabby as a miniature scarecrow. It puzzles me now to remember with what absurd sincerity I doted on this little toy, half fancying it alive and capable of sensation. I could not sleep unless it was folded in my nightgown. And when it lay there safe and warm, I was comparatively happy, believing it to be happy likewise. Long did the hours seem while I waited the departure of the company, and listened for the sound of Bessie's step on the stairs. Sometimes she would come up in the interval to seek her thimble or her scissors, or perhaps to bring me something by way of supper, a bun or a cheesecake. Then she would sit on the bed while I ate it. And when I had finished, she would tuck the clothes round me, and twice she kissed me and said, "Good night, Miss Jane." When thus gentle, Bessie seemed to me the best, prettiest, kindest being in the world, and I wished most intensely that she would always be so pleasant and amiable, and never push me about, or scold, or task me unreasonably, as she was too often wont to do. Bessie Lee must, I think, have been a girl of good natural capacity. For she was smart in all she did, and had a remarkable knack of narrative. So, at least, I judge from the impression made on me by her nursery tales. She was pretty too, if my recollections of her face and person are correct. I remember her as a slim young woman with black hair, dark eyes, very nice features, and good clear complexion. But she had a capricious and hasty temper, and indifferent ideas of principle or justice. Still, such as she was, I preferred her to any one else at Gateshead Hall. It was the fifteenth of January, about nine o'clock in the morning. Bessie was gone down to breakfast. My cousins had not yet been summoned to their mamma. Eliza was putting on her bonnet and warm garden coat to go and feed her poultry, an occupation of which she was fond, and not less so of selling the eggs to the housekeeper and hoarding up the money she thus obtained. She had a turn for traffic and a marked propensity for saving, shown not only in the fending of eggs and chickens, but also in driving hard bargains with the gardener about flower roots, seeds, and slips of plants. That functionary, having orders from Mrs. Reed to buy of his young lady all the products of her parterre she wished to sell, and Eliza would have sold the hair off her head if she could have made a handsome profit thereby. As to her money, she first secreted it in odd corners, wrapped in a rag or an old curl paper. But some of these hoards having been discovered by the housemaid, Eliza, fearful of one day losing her valued treasure, consented to entrust it to her mother at a usurious rate of interest, fifty or sixty per cent, which interest she exacted every quarter, keeping her accounts in a little book with anxious accuracy. Georgiana sat on a high stool, dressing her hair at the glass and interweaving her curls with artificial flowers and faded feathers, of which she had found a store in a drawer in the attic. I was making my bed, having received strict orders from Bessie to get it arranged before she returned, 
Having spread the quilt and folded on my nightdress, I went to the window seat to put in order some picture books and doll's house furniture scattered there. An abrupt command from Georgiana to let her play things alone stopped my proceedings, and then, for lack of other occupation, I fell to breathing on the frost flowers with which the window was fretted, and thus clearing a space in the glass through which I might look out on the grounds, where all was still and petrified under the influence of a hard frost. From this window were visible the porter's lodge and the carriage road, and just as I had dissolved so much of the silver-white foliage veiling the panes as left room to look out, I saw the gates thrown open and a carriage roll through. I watched it ascending the drive with indifference. Carriages often came to Gateshead, but none ever brought fisters in whom I was interested. It stopped in front of the house. The doorbell rang loudly. The newcomer was admitted. All this being nothing to me, my vacant attention soon found lively attraction in the spectacle of a little hungry robin, which came and chirruped on the twigs of the leafless cherry tree nailed against the wall near the casement. The remains of my breakfast of bread and milk stood on the table, and having crumbled a morsel of roll, I was tugging at the sash to put out the crumbs on the window sill when Bessie came running upstairs into the nursery. Miss Jane, take off your pinafore. What are you doing there? Have you washed your hands and face this morning? I gave another tug before I answered, for I wanted the bird to be secure of its bread. The sash yielded. I scattered the crumbs, some on the, some on the stone sill, some on the cherry tree bow. Then, closing the window, I replied, No, Bessie, I have only just finished dusting. Troublesome, careless child, and what are you doing now? You look quite red, as if you had been about some mischief. What were you opening the window for? I was spared the trouble of answering, for Bessie seemed in too great a hurry to listen to explanations. She hauled me to the washstand, inflicted a merciless but happily brief scrub on my face and hands with soap, water, and a coarse towel, disciplined my head with a bristly brush, denuded me of my pinafore, and then hurrying me to the top of the stairs, bid me go down directly, as I was wanted in the breakfast room. I would have asked who wanted me. I would have demanded if Mrs. Reed was there, but Bessie was already gone, and had closed the nursery door upon me. I slowly descended. For nearly three months, I had never been called to Mrs. Reed's presence. Restricted so long to the nursery, the breakfast, dining, and drawing rooms were become for me awful regions, on which it dismayed me to intrude. I now stood in the empty hall. Before me was the breakfast room door, and I stopped. Intimidated and trembling, what a miserable little poltroon had fear engendered of unjust punishment made of me in those days! I feared to return to the nursery and feared to go forward to the parlour. Ten minutes I stood in agitated hesitation. The vehement ringing of the breakfast room bell decided me. I must enter. Who could warn me? I asked inwardly. As with both hands I turned the stiff door handle, which, for a second or two, resisted my efforts. What should I see besides Aunt Reed in the apartment? A man or a woman? The handle turned, the door unclosed, and passing through and curtsy low, I looked up at a black pillar. Such at least appeared to me at first sight, a straight, narrow, sable-clad shape standing erect on the rug. The grim face at the top was like a carved mask placed above the shaft by way of capital. Mrs. Reed occupied her usual seat by the fireside. She made a signal to me to approach. I did so, and she introduced me to the stony stranger with the words, This is the little girl respecting whom I applied to you. He, for it was the man, turned his head slowly towards where I stood, and having examined me with the two inquisitive-looking grey eyes which twinkled under a pair of bushy brows, said solemnly, and in a bass voice, Her size is small. What is her age? Ten years. So much, was the doubtful answer, and he prolonged his scrutiny for some minutes. Presently he addressed me. Your name, little girl? Jane Eyre, sir. In uttering these words I looked up. He seemed to me a tall gentleman, but then I was very little. His features were large, and they and all the lines of his frame were equally harsh and prim. Well, Jane Eyre, and are you a good child? Impossible to reply to this in the affirmative. My little world held a contrary opinion. I was silent. 
Mrs. Reed answered for me by an expressive shake of the head, adding soon, "Perhaps the less said on that subject, the better, Mr. Brocklehurst." Sorry indeed to hear it. She and I must have some talk. And bending from the perpendicular, he installed his person in the armchair opposite Mrs. Reed's. "Come here," he said. I stepped across the rug. He placed me square and straight before him. What a face he had! Now that it was almost on a level with mine, what a great nose! And what a mouth! And what large, prominent teeth! No sight so sad as that of a naughty child. He began, especially a naughty little girl. Do you know where the wicked go after death? They go to hell. Was my ready and orthodox answer. And what is hell? Can you tell me that? A pit full of fire. And should you like to fall into that pit and to be burning there forever? No, sir. What must you do to avoid it? I deliberated a moment. My answer, when it did come, was objectionable. I must keep in good health and not die. How can you keep in good health? Children younger than you die daily. I buried a little child of five years old only a day or two since. A good little child whose soul is now in heaven. It is to be feared the same could not be said of you were you to be called hence. Not being in a condition to remove his doubt, I only cast my eyes down on the two large feet planted on the rug and sighed, wishing myself far enough away. I hope that sigh is from the heart and that you repent of ever having been the occasion of discomfort to your excellent benefactress. Benefactress, benefactress," said I inwardly. They all call Mrs. Reed my benefactress. If so, a benefactress is a disagreeable thing. Do you say your prayers night and morning? Continued my interrogator. Yes, sir. Do you read your Bible? Sometimes. With pleasure. Are you fond of it? I like Revelations and the Book of Daniel and Genesis and Samuel and a little bit of Exodus and some parts of Kings and Chronicles and Job and Jonah. And the Psalms. I hope you like them. No, sir. No. Oh, shocking. I have a little boy younger than you who knows six psalms by heart, and when you ask him which he would rather have, a gingerbread nut to eat or a verse of a psalm to learn, he says, "Oh, the first of a psalm, angels sing psalms." Says he, "I wish to be a little angel here below." He then gets two nuts in recompense of his. He then gets two nuts in recompense for his infant piety. Psalms are not interesting, I remarked. That proves you have a wicked heart. And you must pray to God to change it, to give you a new and clean one, to take away your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I was about to propound a question, touching the manner in which that operation of changing my heart was to be performed, when Mrs. Reed interposed, telling me to sit down. She then proceeded to carry on the conversation herself. Mr. Brocklehurst, I believe I intimated in the letter which I wrote to you three weeks ago that this little girl has not quite the character and disposition I could wish. Should you admit her into Lowood School, I should be glad if the superintendent and teachers were requested to keep a strict eye on her and, above all, to guard against her worst fault, a tendency to deceit. I mentioned this in your hearing, Jane, that you may not attempt to impose on Mr. Brocklehurst. Well, might I dread? Well, might I dislike Mrs. Reed? For it was her nature to wound me cruelly. Never was I happy in her presence. However carefully I obeyed, however strenuously I strove to please her, my efforts were still repulsed and repaid by such sentences as the above. Now, uttered before a stranger, the accusation cut me to the heart. I dimly perceived that she was already obliterating hope from the new phase of existence which she destined me to enter. I felt, though I could not have expressed the feeling, that she was sowing aversion and unkindness along my future path. I saw myself transformed under Mr. Brocklehurst's eye into an artful, noxious child. And what could I do to remedy the injury? Nothing, indeed, thought I, as I struggled to repress a sob. And hastily wiped away some tears, the impotent evidences of my anguish. To see this, indeed, a sad fault in the child," said Mr. Brocklehurst. "It is akin to falsehood, and all liars will have their portion in the lake burning with fire and brimstone. She shall, however, be watched, Mrs. Reed. I will speak to Miss Temple and the teachers. I should wish her to be brought up in a manner suiting her prospects," continued my benefactress. "To be made useful, to be kept humble." As for the vacations, she will, with your permission, spend them always at Lowood. 
Your decisions are perfectly judicious, madam, returned Mr. Brocklehurst. Humility is a Christian grace, and one peculiarly appropriate to the pupils of Lowood. I, therefore, direct that a special care shall be bestowed on its cultivation amongst them. I have studied how best to mortify in them the worldly sentiment of pride, and only the other day I had a pleasing proof of my success. My second daughter, Augusta, went with her mamma to visit the school, and on her return she exclaimed, Oh, dear papa, how quiet and plain all the girls at Lowood look, with their hair combed behind their ears and their long pinafores and those little holland pockets outside their frocks. They are almost like poor people's children. And, said she, she looked at my dress and mamma's as if they had never seen a silk gown before. This is a state of things I quite approve, returned Mrs. Reed. Had I sought all England over, I could scarcely have found a system more exactly fitting a child like Jane Eyre. Consistency, my dear Mr. Brocklehurst, I advocate consistency in all things. Consistency, madam, is the first of Christian duties, and it has been observed in every arrangement connected with the establishment of Lowood. Plain fare, simple attire, and sophisticated accommodations, hardy and active habits, such as the order of the day in the house and its inhabitants. Quite right, sir. I may then depend upon this child being received as a pupil at Lowood, and there being trained in conformity to her position and prospects. Madam, you may. She shall be placed in that nursery of chosen plants, and I trust she will show herself grateful for the inestimable privilege of her election. I will send her then as soon as possible, Mr. Brocklehurst, for I assure you I feel anxious to be relieved of a responsibility that was becoming too irksome. No doubt, no doubt, madam. And now I wish you good morning. I shall return to Brocklehurst Hall in the course of a week or two. My good friend, the Archdeacon, will not permit me to leave him sooner. I shall send Miss Temple notice that she is to expect a new girl, so that there will be no difficulty about receiving her. Goodbye. Goodbye, Mr. Brocklehurst. Remember me to Mrs. and Miss Brocklehurst, and to Augusta and Theodore, and Master Broughton Brocklehurst. I will, madam. Little girl, here is a book entitled The Child's Guide. Read it with prayer, especially that part containing an account of the awfully sudden death of Martha a naughty child addicted to falsehood and deceit. With these words, Mr. Brocklehurst put into my hand a thin pamphlet sewn in a cover, and having rung for his carriage, he departed. Mrs. Reed and I were left alone. Some minutes passed in silence. She was sewing. I was watching her. Mrs. Reed might be at that time some six or seven and thirty. She was a woman of robust frame, square-shouldered and strong-limbed, not tall and, though stout, not obese. She had a somewhat large face, the under jaw being much developed and very solid. Her brow was low, her chin large and prominent, mouth and nose sufficiently regular. Under her light eyebrows glimmered an eye devoid of roof. Her skin was dark and opaque, her hair nearly flaxen, her constitution was sound as a bell. Illness never came near her. She was an exact, clever manager. Her household and tenantry were thoroughly under her control. Her children only at times defied her authority and laughed it to scorn. She dressed well and had a presence and port calculated to set off handsome attire. Sitting on a low stool, a few yards from her armchair, I examined her figure. I perused her features. In my hand, I held the tract containing the sudden death of the liar, to which narrative my attention had been pointed as to an appropriate warning. What had just passed, what Mrs. Reed had said concerning me to Mr. Brocklehurst, the whole tenor of their conversation was recent, raw, and stinging in my mind. I had felt every word as acutely as I had heard it plainly, and a passion of resentment fomented now within me. Mrs. Reed looked up from her work, her eyes settled on mine, her fingers at the same time suspended their nimble movements. Go out of the room, return to the nursery. What's her mandate? My look or something else must have struck her as offensive, for she spoke with extreme though suppressed irritation. I got up, I went to the door, I came back again. I walked to the window, crossed the room, then close up to her. Speak, I must. I had been trodden on severely, and must turn. But how? What strength had I to dart retaliation at my antagonist? I gathered my energies and launched them in this blunt sentence. 
I am not deceitful. If I were, I should say I loved you. But I declare I do not love you. I dislike you the worst of anybody in the world except John Reed. And this book about the liar, you may give to your girl Georgiana, for it is she who tells lies and not I. Mrs. Reed's hand still lay on her work, inactive. Her eye of ice continued to dwell freezingly on mine. What more have you to say? She asked, rather in a tone in which a person might address an opponent of adult age than such as is ordinarily used to a child. That eye of hers, that voice, stirred every antipathy I had. Shaking from head to foot, thrilled with ungovernable excitement, I continued, "I am glad you are no relation of mine." I will never call you Anne again as long as I live. I will never come to see you when I am grown up. And if any one asks me how I liked you and how you treated me, I will say the very thought of you makes me sick, and that you treated me with miserable cruelty. How dare you affirm that, Jane Eyre? How dare I, Mrs. Reed? How dare I? Because it is the truth. You think I have no feelings, and that I can do without one bit of love or kindness. But I cannot live so. And you have no pity. I shall remember how you thrust me back, roughly and violently thrust me back into the red room, and lock me up there to my dying day. Though I was in agony, though I cried out while suffocating with distress, have mercy, have mercy, Aunt Reed, and that punishment you made me suffer because your wicked boy struck me, knocked me down for nothing. I will tell anybody who asks me questions this exact tale. People think you a good woman, but you are bad, hard-hearted. You are deceitful. Ere I had finished this reply, my soul began to expand, to exult, with the strangest sense of freedom, of triumph I ever felt. It seemed as if an invisible bond had burst, and that I had struggled out into unhoped-for liberty. Not without cause was this sentiment. Mrs. Reed looked frightened. Her work had slipped from her knee. She was lifting up her hands, rocking herself to and fro. And even twisting her face as if she would cry, Jane, you are under a mistake. What is the matter with you? Why do you tremble so violently? Would you like to drink some water? No, Mrs. Reed. Is there anything else you wish for, Jane? I assure you, I desire to be your friend, not you. You told Mr. Brocklehurst I had a bad character, a deceitful disposition, and I'll let everybody at Lowood know what you are and what you have done, Jane. You don't understand these things. Children must be corrected for their faults. Deceit is not my fault. I cried out in a savage, high voice. But you are passionate, Jane. That you must allow. And now return to the nursery. There's a dear, and lie down a little. I'm not your dear. I cannot lie down. Send me to school soon, Mrs. Reed, for I hate to live here. I will indeed send her to school soon, murmured Mrs. Reed sotto voce. And gathering up her work, she abruptly quitted the apartment. I was left there alone. Winner of the field, it was the hardest battle I had fought, and the first victory I had gained. I stood a while on the rug where Mr. Brocklehurst had stood, and I enjoyed my conqueror's solitude. First, I smiled to myself and felt elate, but this fierce pleasure subsided in me as fast as did the accelerated throb of my pulses. A child cannot quarrel with its elders, as I had done; cannot give its furious feelings uncontrolled play, as I had given mine. Without experiencing afterwards the pang of remorse and the chill of reaction, a rich of light at heath, alive, glancing, devouring, would have been a meet emblem of my mind when I accused and menaced Mrs. Reed. The same rich, black and blasted after the flames are dead, would have represented as meekly my subsequent condition, when half an hour's silence and reflection had shown me the madness of my conduct and the dreariness of my hated and hating position. Something of vengeance I had tasted for the first time, as aromatic wine it seemed, on swallowing, warm and racy, its after flavour, metallic and corroding, gave me a sensation as if I had been poisoned. Willingly would I now have gone and asked Mrs. Reed's pardon, but I knew, partly from experience and partly from instinct, that was the way to make her repulse me with double scorn, thereby re-exciting every turbulent impulse of my nature. I would fain exercise some better faculty than that of fear speaking, fain find nourishment for some less fiendish feeling than that of sombre indignation. I took a book, some Arabian tales. I sat down and endeavoured to read. I could make no sense of the subject. 
My own thoughts swam always between me and the page I had usually found fascinating. I opened the glass door in the breakfast room. The shrubbery was quite still. The black frost reigned, unbroken by sun or breeze, through the grounds. I covered my head and arms with the skirt of my frock and went out to walk in the part of the plantation which was quite sequestrated. But I found no pleasure in the silent trees, the falling fir cones, the congealed relics of autumn, russet leaves swept by past winds in heaps and now stiffened together. I leaned against the gate and looked into an empty field where no sheep were feeding, where the short grass was nipped and blanched. It was a very grey day, a most opaque sky, onding on snow, canopied all, dense flakes fell at intervals, which settled on the hard path and on the hoary lee without melting. I stood, a wretched child enough, whispering to myself over and over again, What shall I do? What shall I do? All at once I heard a clear voice call, Miss Jane, where are you? Come to lunch. It was Bessie. I knew well enough, but I did not stare. Her light step came tripping down the path. You naughty little thing, she said. Why don't you come when you are called? Bessie's presence, compared with the thoughts over which I had been brooding, seemed cheerful, even though, as usual, she was somewhat cross. The fact is, after my conflict with and victory over Mrs. Reed, I was not disposed to care much for the nursemaid's transitory anger, and I was disposed to bask in her youthful lightness of heart. I just put my two arms round her and said, Come, Bessie, don't scold. The action was more frank and fearless than any I was habituated to indulge in. Somehow it pleased her. You are a strange child, Miss Jane, she said, as she looked down at me. A little roving, solitary thing, and you are going to school, I suppose? I nodded. And won't you be sorry to leave poor Bessie? What does Bessie care for me? She's always scolding me. Because you're such a queer, frightened, shy little thing. You should be bolder. What? To get more knocks? Nonsense. But you are rather put upon, that's certain. My mother said, when she came to see me last week, that she would not like a little one of her own to be in your place. Now, come in, and I have some good news for you. I don't think you have, Bessie. Child, what do you mean? What sorrowful eyes you fix on me? Well, but Mrs. and the young ladies and Master John are going out to tea this afternoon, and you shall have tea with me. I'll ask Cook to bake you a little cake, and then you shall help me to look over your drawers, for I am soon to pack your trunk. Mrs. intends you to leave Gateshead in a day or two, and you shall choose what toys you like to take with you. Bessie, you must promise not to scold me any more till I go. Well, I will, but mind you are a very good girl, and don't be afraid of me. Don't start when I chance to speak rather sharply. It's so provoking. I don't think I shall ever be afraid of you again, Bessie, because I have got used to you, and I shall soon have another set of people to dread. If you dread them, they'll dislike you, as you do, Bessie. I don't dislike you, miss. I believe I'm fonder of you than of all the others. You don't show it. You little sharp thing. You've got quite a new way of talking. What makes you so venturesome and hardy? Why, I shall soon be away from you, and besides, I was going to say something about what had passed between me and Mrs. Reed, but on second thoughts I considered it better to remain silent on that head. And so you're glad to leave me? Not at all, Bessie. Indeed, just now I'm rather sorry. Just now and rather. How coolly my little lady says it. I dare say now if I were to ask you for a kiss you won't give it me, you'd say you'd rather not. I'll kiss you and welcome. Burn your head down. Bessie stooped. We mutually embraced, and I followed her into the house quite comforted. That afternoon lapsed in peace and harmony, and in the evening Bessie told me some of her most enchanting stories, and sang me some of her sweetest songs. Even for me, life had its gleams of sunshine. Engender Engender Verb Cause or give rise to a feeling, situation, or condition. Sotto voce. Sotto voce. Adjective. Of singing or a spoken remark, sung or said in a quiet voice, as if not to be overheard. Sequestrate. Sequestrate. 
verb, to keep people, especially a jury, together in a place so that they cannot be influenced by other people. Jane Eyre, an autobiography, by Charlotte Bronte. Chapter 5 Five o'clock had hardly struck on the morning of the 19th of January when Bessie brought a candle into my closet and found me already up and nearly dressed. I had risen half an hour before her entrance and had washed my face and put on my clothes by the light of a half-moon just setting whose rays streamed through the narrow window near my crib. I was to leave Gateshead that day by a coach which passed the lodge gates at 6 a.m. Bessie was the only person yet risen. She had lit the fire in the nursery, where she now proceeded to make my breakfast. Few children can eat when excited with the thoughts of a journey, nor could I. Bessie, having pressed me in vain to take a few spoonfuls of the boiled milk and bread she had prepared for me, wrapped up some biscuits in a paper and put them into my bag. Then she helped me on with my pelisse and bonnet, and wrapping herself in a shawl, she and I left the nursery. As we passed Mrs. Reed's bedroom, she said, Would you go in and bid Mrs. Goodbye? No, Bessie. She came to my crib last night when you were gone down to supper, and said I need not disturb her in the morning, or my cousins either. And she told me to remember that she had always been my best friend, and to speak of her and be grateful to her accordingly. What did you say, Miss? Nothing. I covered my face with the bedclothes and turned from her to the wall. That was wrong, Miss Jane. It was quite right, Bessie. Your missus has not been my friend. She has been my foe. Oh, Miss Jane, don't say so. Goodbye to Gateshead, cried I, as we passed through the hall and went out at the front door. The moon was set, and it was very dark. Bessie carried the lantern, whose light glance on wet steps and gravel road sodden by a recent thaw. Raw and chill was the winter morning. My teeth chattered as I hastened down the drive. There was a light in the porter's lodge. When we reached it, we found the porter's wife just kindling her fire. My trunk, which had been carried down the evening before, stood corded at the door. It wanted but a few minutes of six, and shortly after that hour had struck, the distant roll of wheels announced the coming coach. I went to the door and watched its lamps approach rapidly through the gloom. Is she going by herself? asked the porter's wife. Yes. And how far is it? Fifty miles. What a long way. I wonder Mrs. Reed is not afraid to trust her so far alone. The coach drew up. There it was at the gates with its four horses and its top laden with passengers. The guard and coachman loudly urged haste. My trunk was hoisted up. I was taken from Bessie's neck, to which I clung with kisses. Be sure and take good care of her, cried she to the guard, as he lifted me into the inside. Aye, aye, was the answer. The door was slapped too. A voice exclaimed, All right, and on we drove. Thus was I severed from Bessie and Gateshead. Thus well the way to unknown, and, as I then deemed, remote and mysterious regions. I remember but little of the journey. I only know that the day seemed to me of a preternatural length, and that we appeared to travel over hundreds of miles of road. We passed through several towns, and in one, a very large one, the coach stopped, the horses were taken out, and the passengers alighted to die. I was carried into an inn, where the guard wanted me to have some dinner. But, as I had no appetite, he left me in an immense room with a fireplace at each end, a chandelier pendant from the ceiling, and a little red gallery high up against the wall filled with musical instruments. Here I walked about for a long time, feeling very strange and mortally apprehensive of someone coming in and kidnapping me, for I believed in kidnappers, their exploits having frequently figured in Bessie's Fireside Chronicles, at last the guard returned. Once more I was stowed away in a coach. My protector mounted his own seat, sounded his hollow horn, and away we rattled over the stony streets of L in blank. The afternoon came on wet and somewhat misty. As it waned into dusk, I began to feel that we were getting very far indeed from Gateshead. 
We ceased to pass through towns. The country changed. Great grey hills heaved up round the horizon. As twilight deepened, we descended a valley, dark with wood, and long after night had overclouded the prospect, I heard a wild wind rushing amongst trees. Lulled by the sound, I at last dropped asleep. I had not long slumbered when a sudden cessation of motion awoke me. The coach door was open, and a person like a servant was standing at it. I saw her face and dress by the light of the lamps. Is there a little girl called Jane Eyre here? she asked. I answered yes, and was then lifted out. My trunk was handed down, and the coach instantly drove away. I was stiff with long sitting, and bewildered with the noise and motion of the coach. Gathering my faculties, I looked about me. Rain, wind, and darkness filled the air. Nevertheless, I dimly discerned a wall before me and a door open in it. Through this door, I passed with my new guide. She shut and locked it behind her. There was now visible a house or houses, for the building spread far, with many windows and lights burning in some. We went up a broad pebbly path, splashing wet, and were admitted at a door. Then the servant led me through a passage into a room with a fire, where she left me alone. I stood and warmed my numbed fingers over the blaze. Then I looked round. There was no candle, but the uncertain light from the hearth showed, by intervals, papered walls, carpet curtains, shining mahogany furniture. It was a parlour, not so spacious or splendid as the drawing room at Gateshead, but comfortable enough. I was puzzling to make out the subject of a picture on the wall when the door opened and an individual carrying a light entered. Another followed close behind. The first was a tall lady with dark hair, dark eyes, and a pale and large forehead. Her figure was partly enveloped in a shawl. Her countenance was grave. Her bearing erect. The child is very young to be sent alone," said she, putting her candle down on the table. She considered me attentively for a minute or two, then further added. She had better be put to bed soon. She looks tired. Are you tired? She asked, placing her hand on my shoulder. A little, ma'am, and hungry too, no doubt. Let her have some supper before she goes to bed, Miss Miller. Is this the first time you have left your parents to come to school, my little girl? I explained to her that I had no parents. She inquired how long they had been dead, then how old I was, what was my name, whether I could read, write, and sew a little. Then she touched my cheek gently with her forefinger and, saying, she hoped I should be a good child, dismissed me along with Miss Miller. The lady I had left might be about twenty-nine. The one who went with me appeared some years younger. The first impressed me by her voice, look and air. Miss Miller was more ordinary, ruddy in complexion, though of a careworn countenance, hurried in gait and action, like one who had always a multiplicity of tasks on hand. She looked, indeed, what I afterwards found she really was, an under-teacher. Led by her, I passed from compartment to compartment, from passage to passage of a large and irregular building, till, emerging from the total and somewhat dreary silence pervading that portion of the house we had traversed, we came upon the hum of many voices, and presently entered a wide, long room, with great deal tables, two at each end, on each of which burned a pair of candles, and seated all round on benches a congregation of girls of every age, from nine or ten to twenty. Seen by the dim light of the dips, their number to me appeared countless, though not in reality exceeding eighty. They were uniformly dressed in brown stuff frocks of quaint fashion and long holland pinafores. It was the hour of study. They were engaged in conning over their tomorrow's task, and the hum I had heard was the combined result of their whispered repetitions. Miss Miller signed to me to sit on a bench near the door. Then, walking up to the top of the long room, she cried out, Monitors, collect the lesson books and put them away. Four tall girls arose from different tables, and going round, gathered the books and removed them. Miss Miller again gave the word of command. Monitors, fetch the supper trays. The tall girls went out and returned presently, each bearing a tray with portions of something, I knew not what, arranged thereon, and a pitcher of water and mug in the middle of each tray. The portions were handed round. Those who liked took a draught of the water, the mug being common to all. When it came to my turn, I drank, 
for I was thirsty, but did not touch the food, excitement and fatigue rendering me incapable of eating. I now saw, however, that it was a thin oaten cake shared into fragments. The meal over, prayers were read by Miss Miller, and the classes filed off, two and two upstairs. Overpowered by this time with weariness, I scarcely noticed what sort of a place the bedroom was, except that, like the schoolroom, I saw it was very long. Tonight I was to be Miss Miller's bedfellow. She helped me to undress. When laid down, I glanced at the long rows of beds, each of which was quickly filled with two occupants. In ten minutes the single light was extinguished, and amidst silence and complete darkness I fell asleep. The night passed rapidly. I was too tired even to dream. I only once awoke to hear the wind rave in furious gusts, and the rain fall in torrents, and to be sensible that Miss Miller had taken her place by my side. When I again unclosed my eyes, a loud bell was ringing. The girls were up and dressing, day had not yet begun to dawn, and a rush light or two burned in the room. I too rose reluctantly. It was bitter cold, and I dressed as well as I could for shivering and watched when there was a basin at liberty, which did not occur soon, as there was but one basin to six girls, on the stands down the middle of the room. Again the bell rang, all formed in file, two and two, and in that order descended the stairs, and entered the cold and dimly lit schoolroom. Here prayers were read by Miss Miller. Afterwards she called out, Form classes! A great tumult succeeded for some minutes, during which Miss Miller repeatedly exclaimed, Silence and order when it subsided. I saw them all drawn up in four semicircles before four chairs placed at the four tables. All held books in their hands, and a great book like a Bible lay on each table before the vacant seat. A pause of some seconds succeeded, filled up by the low, vague hum of numbers. Miss Miller walked from class to class, hushing this indefinite sound. A distant bell tinkled. Immediately three ladies entered the room. Each walked to a table and took her seat. Miss Miller assumed the fourth vacant chair, which was that nearest the door, and around which the smallest of the children were assembled. To this inferior class I was called and placed at the bottom of it. Business now began. The day's collect was repeated. Then certain texts of scripture were said, and to these succeeded a protracted reading of chapters in the Bible which lasted an hour. By the time that exercise was terminated, day had fully dawned. The indefatigable bell now sounded for the fourth time. The classes were marshalled and marched into another room to breakfast. How glad I was to behold a prospect of getting something to eat. I was now nearly sick from inanition, having taken so little the day before. The refectory was a great, low-sealed, gloomy room. On two long tables smoked basins of something hot, which, however, to my dismay, sent forth an odour far from inviting. I saw a universal manifestation of discontent when the fumes of the repast met the nostrils of those destined to swallow it. From the van of the procession, the tall girls of the first class rose to whispered words. Disgusting! The porridge is burnt again! Silence! ejaculated the voice not that of Miss Miller, but one of the upper teachers, a little and dark personage, smartly dressed, but of somewhat morose aspect, who installed herself at the top of one table, while a more buxom lady presided at the other. I looked in vain for her I had first seen the night before. She was not visible. Miss Miller occupied the foot of the table where I sat, and a strange foreign-looking elderly lady, the French teacher, as I afterwards found, took the corresponding seat at the other board. A long grace was said and a hymn sung, then a servant brought in some tea for the teachers, and a meal began. Ravenous and now very faint, I devoured a spoonful or two of my portion without thinking of its taste, but the first edge of hunger blunted, I perceived I had gone in hand a nauseous mess. Burnt porridge is almost as bad as rotten potatoes. Famine itself soon sickens over it. The spoons were moved slowly. I saw each girl taste her food and try to swallow it. But in most cases the effort was soon relinquished. Breakfast was over and none had breakfasted. Thanks being returned for what we had not got and a second hymn chanted, 
The refectory was evacuated for the schoolroom. I was one of the last to go out, and in passing the tables, I saw one teacher take a basin of the porridge and taste it. She looked at the others; all their countenances expressed displeasure, and one of them, the stout one, whispered, "Abominable stuff! How shameful!" A quarter of an hour passed before lessons again began, during which the schoolroom was in a glorious tumult. For that space of time, it seemed to be permitted to talk loud and more freely, and they used their privilege. The whole conversation ran on the breakfast, which one and all abused roundly. Poor things! It was the sole consolation they had. Miss Miller was now the only teacher in the room. A group of great girls standing about her spoke with serious and sullen gestures. I heard the name of Mister Brocklehurst pronounced by some lips. At which Miss Miller shook her head disapprovingly, but she made no great effort to check the general wrath. Doubtless she shared in it. A clock in the schoolroom struck nine. Miss Miller left her circle and, standing in the middle of the room, cried, "Silence to your seats!" Discipline prevailed. In five minutes, the confused throng was resolved into order, and comparative silence quelled the babel clamor of tongues. The upper teachers now punctually resumed their posts, but still all seemed to wait. Ranged on benches down the sides of the room, the eighty girls sat motionless and erect. A quaint assemblage they appeared, all with plain locks combed from their faces, not a curl visible, in brown dresses made high and surrounded by a narrow tucker about the throat, with little pockets of holland tied in front of their frocks. And destined to serve the purpose of a work bag, all two wearing woollen stockings and country-made shoes fastened with brass buckles. About twenty of those clad in this costume were full-grown girls, or rather young women. It suited them ill, and gave an air of oddity even to the prettiest. I was still looking at them, and also at intervals examining the teachers, none of whom precisely pleased me. For the stout one was a little coarse, the dark one not a little fierce, the foreigner harsh and grotesque, and Miss Miller, poor thing, looked purple, weather-beaten, and overworked. When, as my eye wandered from face to face, the whole school rose simultaneously, as if moved by a common spring. What was the matter? I had heard no order given. I was puzzled. Ere I had gathered my wits, the classes were again seated. But as all eyes were now turned to one point, mine followed the general direction and encountered the personage who had received me last night. She stood at the bottom of the long room on the hearth, for there was a fire at each end. She surveyed the two rows of girls silently and gravely. Miss Miller, approaching, seemed to ask her a question, and having received her answer, went back to her place and said aloud, "Monitor of the first class, fetch the globes." While the direction was being executed, the lady consulted and moved slowly up the room. I suppose I have a considerable organ of veneration, for I retain yet the sense of admiring awe with which my eyes traced her steps. See now, in broad daylight, she looked tall, fair, and shapely, brown eyes with a benignant light in their irides, and a fine pencilling of long lashes round relieved the whiteness of her large front. On each of her temples, her hair of a very dark brown was clustered in round curls, according to the fashion of those times, when neither smooth bands nor long ringlets were in vogue. Her dress, also in the mode of the day, was of purple cloth, relieved by a sort of Spanish trimming of black velvet. A gold watch shone at her girdle. Let the reader add to complete the picture: refined features, a complexion. If pale, clear, and a stately air and carriage, and he will have, at least, as clearly as words can give it, a correct idea of the exterior of Miss Temple, Maria Temple, as I afterwards saw the name written in the prayer book entrusted to me to carry to church. The superintendent of Lowood, having taken her seat before a pair of globes placed on one of the tables, summoned the first class round her and commenced giving a lesson on geography. The lower classes were called by the teachers. Repetitions in history, grammar, etc., went on for an hour. 
Writing and arithmetic succeeded, and music lessons were given by Miss Temple to some of the elder girls. The duration of each lesson was measured by the clock, which at last struck twelve. The superintendent rose. "I have a word to address to the pupils," said she. The tumult of cessation from lessons was already breaking forth, but it sank at her voice. She went on. You had this morning a breakfast which you could not eat. You must be hungry. I have ordered that a lunch of bread and cheese shall be served to all. The teachers looked at her with a sort of surprise. It is to be done on my responsibility, she added, in an explanatory tone to them, and immediately afterwards left the room. The bread and cheese was presently brought in and distributed, to the high delight and refreshment of the whole school. The order was now given to the guard. Each put on a coarse straw bonnet with strings of coloured calico and a cloak of grey frieze. I was similarly equipped, and following the stream, I made my way into the open air. The garden was a wide enclosure, surrounded with walls so high as to exclude every glimpse of prospect. A covered veranda ran down one side, and broad walks bordered a middle space divided into scores of little beds. These beds were assigned as gardens for the pupils to cultivate, and each bed had an owner. When full of flowers, they would doubtless look pretty. But now, at the latter end of January, all was wintry blight and brown decay. I shuddered as I stood and looked round me. It was an inclement day for outdoor exercise. Not positively rainy, but darkened by a drizzling yellow fog, all underfoot was still soaking wet with the floods of yesterday. The stronger among the girls ran about and engaged in active games, but sundry pale and thin ones herded together for shelter and warmth in the veranda. And amongst these, as the dense mist penetrated to their shivering frames, I heard frequently the sound of a hollow cough. As yet, I had spoken to no one. Nor did anybody seem to take notice of me. I stood lonely enough, but to that feeling of isolation I was accustomed. It did not oppress me much. I leant against the pillar of the veranda, drew my grey mantle close about me, and trying to forget the cold which nipped me without and the unsatisfied hunger which gnawed me within, delivered myself up to the employment of watching and thinking. My reflections were too undefined and fragmentary to merit record. I hardly yet knew where I was. Gateshead and my past life seemed floated away to an immeasurable distance. The present was vague and strange, and of the future I could form no conjecture. I looked round the convent-like garden and then up at the house, a large building, half of which seemed grey and old, the other half quite new. The new part, containing the schoolroom and dormitory, was lit by mullioned and lattice windows, which gave it a church-like aspect. A stone tablet over the door bore this inscription: "Lowood Institution." This portion was built A.D. blank by Naomi Brocklehurst of Brocklehurst Hall in this county. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. And glorify your Father which is in heaven, Saint Matthew, verse sixteen. I read these words over and over again. I felt that an explanation belonged to them, and was unable fully to penetrate their import. I was still pondering the signification of institution and endeavouring to make out a connection between the first words and the verse of Scripture, when the sound of a cough close behind me made me turn my head. I saw a girl sitting on a stone bench near. She was bent over a book, on the perusal of which she seemed intent. From where I stood, I could see the title. It was Rasselas, a name that struck me as strange and consequently attractive. In turning a leaf, she happened to look up, and I said to her directly, "Is your book interesting?" I had already formed the intention of asking her to lend it to me some day. I like it," she answered, after a pause of a second or two, during which she examined me. "What is it about?" I continued. "I hardly know where I found the hardihood thus to open a conversation with a stranger. The step was contrary to my nature and habits, but I think her occupation touched a chord of sympathy somewhere, for I too liked reading, though of a frivolous and childish kind. I could not digest or comprehend the serious or substantial." You may look at it," replied the girl, 
offering me the book. I did so. A brief examination convinced me that the contents were less taking than the title. Rasselas looked down to my trifling taste. I saw nothing about fairies, nothing about genii. No bright variety seemed spread over the closely printed pages. I returned it to her. She received it quietly, without saying anything. She was about to relapse into her former studious mood. Again, I ventured to disturb her. Can you tell me what the writing on that stone over the door means? What is Lowood Institution, this house where you are come to live? And why do they call it institution? Is it in any way different from other schools? It is partly a charity school. You and I, and all the rest of us, are charity children. I suppose you are an orphan. Are not either your father or your mother dead? Both died before I can remember. Well, all the girls here have lost either one or both parents, and this is called an institution for educating orphans. Do we pay no money? Do they keep us for nothing? We pay. Our friends pay. Fifteen pounds a year for each. Then why do they call us charity children? Because fifteen pounds is not enough for board and teaching. And the deficiency is supplied by subscription. Who subscribes? Different benevolent-minded ladies and gentlemen in this neighbourhood and in London. Who was Naomi Brocklehurst, the lady who built the new part of this house, as that tablet records? And whose son overlooks and directs everything here? Why? Because he is treasurer and manager of the establishment. Then this house does not belong to that tall lady who wears a watch. And who said we were to have some bread and cheese? To Miss Temple? Oh no! I wish it did. She has to answer to Mister Brocklehurst for all she does. Mister Brocklehurst buys all our food and all our clothes. Does he live here? No, two miles off in a large hall. Is he a good man? He is a clergyman and is said to do a great deal of good. Did you say that tall lady was called Miss Temple? Yes. And what are the other teachers called? The one with red cheeks is called Miss Smith. She attends to the work and cuts out, for we make our own clothes, our frocks and pelisses and everything. The little one with black hair is Miss Sketchet. She teaches history and grammar, and hears the second-class repetitions. And the one who wears a shawl and has a pocket handkerchief tied to her side with a yellow ribbon is Madame Pierrot. She comes from Lyon in France and teaches French. Do you like the teachers? Well enough. Do you like the little black one and the madam? I cannot pronounce her name as you do. Miss Sketchard is hasty. You must take care not to offend her. Madame Piero is not a bad sort of person, but Miss Temple is the best, isn't she? Miss Temple is very good and very clever. She is above the rest because she knows far more than they do. Have you been long here? Two years. Are you an orphan? My mother is dead. Are you happy here? You ask rather too many questions. I have given your answers enough for the present. Now I want to read. But at that moment, the summons sounded for dinner. All re-entered the house. The odor which now filled the refectory was scarcely more appetizing than that which had regaled our nostrils at breakfast. The dinner was served in two huge tin plated vessels. Whence rose a strong steam redolent of rancid fat. I found the mess to consist of indifferent potatoes and strange shreds of rusty meat mixed and cooked together. Of this preparation, a tolerably abundant plateful was apportioned to each pupil. I ate what I could and wondered within myself whether every day's fare would be like this. After dinner, we immediately adjourned to the schoolroom. Lessons recommenced and were continued till five o'clock. The only marked event of the afternoon was that I saw the girl with whom I had conversed in the veranda dismissed in disgrace by Miss Sketchard from a history class and sent to stand in the middle of the large schoolroom. The punishment seemed to me, in a high degree, ignominious, especially for so great a girl. She looked thirteen or upwards. I expected she would show signs of great distress and shame. But to my surprise, she neither wept nor blushed. Composed, though grave, she stood, the central mark of all eyes. How can she bear it so quietly, so firmly? I asked of myself. Were I in her place, it seems to me I should wish the earth to open and swallow me up. 
She looks as if she were thinking of something beyond her punishment, beyond her situation, of something not round her nor before her. I have heard of daydreams. Is she in a daydream now? Her eyes are fixed on the floor, but I am sure they do not see it. Her sight seems turned in, gone down into her heart. She is looking at what she can remember. I believe, not at what is really present. I wonder what sort of a girl she is, whether good or naughty. Soon after 5 p.m., we had another meal, consisting of a small mug of coffee and half a slice of brown bread. I devoured my bread and drank my coffee with relish. But I should have been glad of as much more. I was still hungry. Half an hour's recreation succeeded, then study, then a glass of water and a piece of oat cake, prayers, and bed. Such was my first day at Lowood. Police, police. Now, a woman's ankle-length cloak with armholes or sleeves. Inanition. Inanition. Now, exhaustion caused by lack of nourishment. Mullioned. Mullioned. Adjective: window with vertical parts, usually made of stone, separating the glass parts. Buxom. Buxom, adjective of a woman, plump with a full figure and large breasts. Benignant. Benignant, adjective, kindly and benevolent. Ignominious. Ignominious, adjective, deserving or causing public disgrace or shame.